before we get started, um, some of you may have seen the tweet that we put out earlier this week about the, uh, the YouTube channel and some statistics that we've been looking at have shown that viewers of the video, on average, 70% of the viewers aren't subscribed to the channel. So if you are watching, if you are enjoying what we're doing, please subscribe. It doesn't cost anything. There's only a little button in the corner. You haven't even got to scroll down, I don't think. Just hit that subscribe button. And hopefully we can we can flip their numbers around. But yeah, let's get into it. Mark Phillips. How you doing you right yeah really good really good obviously just tired pouring down so uh <laughs> it's all good though how, how you um how you feeling after your recent sort of um adventure shall we say yeah I'm, I'm i'm a lot better than i was um i've been out on um, bike rides mainly uh trying to get my lungs open again almost like trying to break myself in again my lungs because they were so tight literally yeah. I'd, I'd wake up and i'd be struggling or having breathing problems it wouldn't be struggling almost like I've never had asthma or any breathing problems, but I probably would liken it to like what people said when they get tight chest from asthma. Um, it's completely random. It might like the heat brought it on. Um, and then this morning I woke up and it was there again. And I've been good as gold for the last two weeks. I've been really kind of cranking up the fitness. So I'm feeling better. But then they just come back from nowhere today. So it's, it's, it's a weird one. I don't really understand it myself. I'm just trying to keep active. Yeah, it is a, it's a strange time, isn't it? And everyone seems to be having coughs and, like, say, flu sweats and all that sort of stuff. It's just, just strange. Yeah, no, no, it's hundred percent. Yeah, well, obviously glad you're all right now, anyway. But um, yeah, I don't know where. Sort of the 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 stuff that I I sent to you, obviously, it was mainly um, focusing around your time at South End. But do, do you want to go into like pre South End, like your Millwall? Brentford career as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm easy yeah, with you guys. I'm willing to have a discussion on whatever you want to cover, really. Um, Perfect. We'll see where it goes. So yeah, um, so you're, you're Millwall right from right from a kid, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I joined Millwall at 13 years old uh, as a schoolboy, as called back then. Um, a little bit late, kind of in terms of the ages kids are now getting picked up, but that was mainly due to my Sunday league team uh, being so successful. And, and our manager actually not allowing us to go to professional clubs, even though there was, there was interest. Um, so, yeah, 13 years old, I got picked up. And then within a year, I was being kind of shoved into the under-18s team, taken out of secondary school. Uh, it all happened a bit quick, really. Uh, I didn't really know what was going on. I was first, in, first time in a professional environment. It was all new. And I was like a big kid with my eyes jumping out of my head, just loving it. You know, and just take it, playing as much as football as I could. And then... Obviously, obviously, it went well because I progressed quite, progressed quite quickly, even though I was totally unaware how well I was doing. Just playing for the love of it, really. You're a Millwall fan, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So my dad, my dad was a Millwall fan. It's a bit of a bit of a funny one because obviously Millwall fans are Millwall fans, um, and you are only Millwall. So <laughs> I, but as a kind of eighties eighties kid, Liverpool were the main team, and I had a whatever way you want to look I had a kid on my street who was, who was, who was a scouser and he kind of uh, led me down a dark path to, to support <laughs> Liverpool and he used to take me up to the cop uh, kind of once a month and I was, I was only a nipper like I was about like nine, ten years old um, and I think for any football fan the cop is a, is a pretty amazing scene and to be sitting in it I, I, I loved it I got the buzz for the game from that really um, so my dad was Arden Millwall's whole life but then I had this this little passion for Liverpool as well. He must have been fuming with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't seem to remember him being that bothered, but um, he, I'm sure. I'm sure he was because he, he obviously steered me down the road of joining Mill. So maybe that was his, his way of uh, getting me away from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did it take you to sort of make your way into the first team at, at Millwall? Um, yes, yeah, so I got my YTS. It was called back then my apprenticeship at 16 when I left yeah. school. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I did my first year uh, YTS. Then I, my second year, that was when I kind of made my debut. 
Uh, got my first year pro, so I was about 18, 18 at the time. I made my debut in the uh, in the cup actually, in the Carling one, Carling Cup, um, and then my made my full league debut season after at nineteen, uh, which was oh. away to Preston in the, in the championship. Which is another that's, that's young, what, what, like you th- yeah, at, at that yeah, level as well. Yeah. That... yeah, it was it was it was a really good squad. But at the time, Mill was really strong. It was it was they'd fly and they they I was around the kind of the LDV. Um, Final at Wembley for Millwall. Uh, they won Division One, which was obviously the old, the old Championship, and from League One, so to go to the Championship, Division One, um, and then so to be around that, then plays it, it was it was really really good. Um, had some amazing. I was I was in the reserve team from quite a young age, uh, and and the reserve, reserve play. I'm playing with people like Nigel Spink, who I don't know if you remember him, but Man. an absolute legend of a guy. And obviously he was coming on to his, his his later days, and he was really encouraging us youngsters, really giving us like so much knowledge in in these reserve games. Uh, Bobby Bowery, Ricky Newman, some boys that have played like the highest level, and they were kind of obviously coming a little bit older, but they were so so passionate about passing on their knowledge to us and helping us out. We we won the we won the reserve league that year, um, and uh, actually fun enough, Southend boys. I was um, with um, uh, Leon Court uh, at the back. Uh, with so Court, he actually had an amazing year. Um, didn't get kept to Mill, but then went on to do amazing things, which I was really pleased about because we were playing centre back together. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a funny old world. So I, I was getting success because the first team were doing so well. It could have been earlier, but the first team was such such great players. Um, I had to be a bit patient, even though I was chomping a bit. I was a bit of a, I wouldn't call it a cocky lad, but I was very confident. And in, in, not in an arrogant kind of way, but I was very confident that I could jump into that first team. And it was almost like the the, the uh, pro contract, which everyone fixes their mind on. You speak to any kind of young pros or young YTS, they all want a professional contract. That's the, that's the, that's the kind of the, the glory. And for me, I didn't see it like that. I almost saw that as a stepping stone to playing that first team. My uh, my goal was to play in that first team, in that buzz with thousands of people watching me and and show people what I could do. So almost the professional contract was something that was going to happen to get to where I needed to get. So it was just part of the journey, really, for me. Right. You played with there's some, there were some quality characters in that team as well back then. You had like Tony Warner, the keeper. Obviously, like Neil Harris would have been there. A few others. So, what was that like being quite a young, young, young player with them? Not though. Um, it was, it was, it was funny because my my youth team were what's the polite way of putting it? We had some characters, some yeah. some proper characters in my youth team. Um, it was a doggy dog world. We we would have fights daily. I would recommend it. And I <laughs> It's, it's not right at all, but we would have fights daily in the change rooms. And it was a strange one, really, because some of the, some of the boys in my youth team were so rough that it was almost like some of the first teamers were scared of them already because they knew, <laughs> we were only 17, 18, but they knew if they, if they, because there was quite a kind of hierarchy structure back then that the first team were the, the governors and, and you were kind of like, still earning your stripes kind of thing. There was very much that mentality. And I was, I was quite quiet and confident, but there some of the mum teammates were, they, they, the first team wouldn't mess around with them. So, <laughs> so it was kind of like, I, I've got an early kind of upbringing anyway in, in my youth team days. <laughs> That's quality, that. I like that. So, I won't, um, I won't, we, won't, we won't go into some of the stories that, that went on because <laughs> I can tell you stories for weeks. So a little bit, a little bit <laughs> below the belt. <laughs> Imagine. I can imagine. So when you um, obviously you then uh, you eventually move on to to Brentford was that was that a case of like were were you released or did you want sort of more regular football? How did how um, did that all come so, about? So that come about obviously I had some great times under Dennis Wise uh, with Ray Wilkins. Uh, Mark McGee actually gave my debut, so I was really thankful to him. Um, we could have actually we we narrowly one year missed out on the got the FA Cup final and then we narrowly missed out the season after I think it was um, to the Premier League we were a couple of points away from the playoffs and we beat all the big teams we beat West Ham Ipswich everyone that got promoted that year um, we lost unfortunately the teams in the, the lower half of the league which ultimately cost us um, so I had some great times there playing playing, playing the middle and, and, but I was, I was ravaged by injuries really um, you speak to most most middle fans obviously I'm, I'm pretty honest um, my, my downfall was my injuries uh, I, I would, I was back then. I was actually fast, believe it or not. And uh, I used to pick up hamstring injuries quite a lot. Um, I tore my cruciate, my ACL twice while I was at Millwall. Um, obviously, 
battled back as quick as I could to get back in the team. Um, and Mark McGee used to throw me back in. I pulled my hamstring, had three or four unbelievable games, pulled my hamstring again. And it was kind of that way for like a year to 18 months. So it was quite a frustrating period where I couldn't really achieve what I wanted to achieve. But the year under Dennis Wise was was probably my highlight, really, of being involved in that in that kind of title chasing the year where a lot of money was thrown in. Being playing in some, the team with some, some unbelievable players. Uh, but ultimately... Uh, the t- club went into a bit of a kind of downhill spiral with with Theo Pafitas leaving. It's quite well documented what went on. Uh, a kind of I think it was three or four managers in one season after that, and the club got relegated. And then I I, I, I was on the verge to move to M- MK Dons actually, and which is I've, I've done a tweet a couple of days ago, which is quite relative with the Lyle Taylor thing, and I'm not just the final saying it's right or anything like that, but. But my story was that I was I was due to move to MK Dons under Paul Ince, and um, because I wasn't having a good time with a guy called Willie Donahue, didn't didn't kind of give me much of a chance. Uh, so I was going to move on, and I, I went to I went there. It was all done and done dusted. Trained um, trained over the weekend. Come back to Millwall to just kind of get a get a paperwork done. Um, and the man just you know, been quite a young guy still, impressionable, the young. The manager said, oh, "Why don't you train this session?" I, I knew I knew I shouldn't, but being being a hungry guy, I, I wanted to. And um, unfortunately, the first ten minutes, the goalie coach threw a ridiculous throw over my head, which I had to bring out the sky and land at the same time, and I bust my cruciate for a second time. So that season, I then watched, obviously being frustrated even more so because MK Dons won the league that year. I could already see the potential. It was the first year the stadium got built there. Pretty impressive place. Uh, Paul Lynch had built a great team. Um, some real good players in there, ex-Premier League players. So I was really buzzing for him. That happened. And then Kenny Jackett came in through through that time. And obviously he wanted to implement his own own ideas, bringing his own players. He didn't know me. I was in the injury room still with a cruise ship. Um, and unfortunately, I was kind of just one of the ones that, that had to had to leave because I was injured and I was an easy easy one to free up. Um, so I had to kind of rush myself to the, for the, with the Brentford move. Um, I, was, I hadn't played a game. I hadn't played a game. I hadn't barely trained the training session. I'd done all just work with the physio. And um, fortunately enough, uh, went to Brentford and obviously the rest is history. And had, a, had an unbelievable the year there. Amazing club. Met some great friends for life. And we, we won the league. Was that was that League One? Yeah, one, one League One. Uh, league Two, we won to go to League One. Right. Okay. You pissed it, didn't you, if I remember rightly? Didn't you just... Yeah, we, we, yeah we did. Yeah, we did. We were games, games to ha- in hand. But again, real humble group. Uh, didn't didn't really know how good we were. We were just really tight knit. We'd we'd go out every game and, and we got the points we needed. And it was only really about a month, five weeks before the season finished, and we were we were looking at each other going, "We could do this," you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really was a case that we were so focused just on every game. We didn't really consider the bigger picture, which obviously the coaching staff fair play to them that they 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 probably saw it all along and just guided us the right way. Which is hats off to them. Who was the manager actually? Uh, so we had Andy Scott and Terry Bullen yeah. was the assistant. Yeah. Red for boy Terry. Yeah. So, so just um, just quickly going back to Millwall, were, were you around um, for the FA Cup final? What what? Yeah. What year was so that? that was that was the period that I'd done uh, my cruise ship the first time. So right. I, was, I was I was I was coming back from that the first time because they. they it, it was just a freak, freak one. So I was in the stands in the squad's box. I wasn't fit to, to be part of the squad. I, I think I played in one of the earlier rounds, one of the first first rounds of that. Um, but then, yeah, I've, I've done my cruise the first time. So I missed out on that one. But I was there, obviously, supporting the boys. Mm. Yeah, that was, a, that was a Cardiff, wasn't it? Yeah, the, yeah when, when the new Wembley has been built. So it was at a Millennium Stadium. Um, yeah, great day out, even, obviously. My situation my, was my situation, so I, I got my head around it. So it wasn't that I, like I felt like I was missing out. Yeah, it was disappointing probably on the day, but uh, I knew I, there was no chance of me playing. So it was, it was a little bit different. I could just focus on helping the boys, really. Yeah. yeah. Did, um, did Millwall, as a result, qualify for Europe for that? Yes, yes. So I was back for that. Um, another, another great. So we were out in Hungary. Um, <laughs> Crazy, crazy country. Um, <laughs> uh, the, it seemed like a throwback to kind of the 80s, like the way that um, obviously Millwall's got a bit of a reputation in terms of the fans and, and being quite quite tough, should we say. And 
we were walking around the town centre and we were seeing like these guys were just ridiculous and they're, they're fans and um, we walked into the stadium and there was flares going off the uh, drums people were chucking stuff at us and I'm, I'm look, I looked to my left and right and I was looking at like kind of like seven foot like, like trained assassin looking guys and I said what, like, what are these fans or something and they like, no they're the stewards um, <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to kind of uh, keep the fans that's how bad the fans were because they needed people like that just to kind of just to be a stewards and I was like oh what is going on here <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure the Millwall fans could abandon themselves to be fair so yeah no no, no yeah yeah but, just that, just quickly as well. I don't know if you was about for this because my um, my granddad's a Millwall fan, and he took me to a cup game when Millwall played Liverpool. Yeah, and it, yep. and it badly kicked off, and there was police all, all on the pitch. Did you play in that, or was you there at all? Was you? Um, I was there for one Liverpool ones. Um, I'm not too sure if it was that one or, or yeah, it probably was that one um, because who played Milan? What's his name? Barros was it? it was I think. Yeah, I think. Barros, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think. Did he, he, I he can't was remember. Up front. Um, yeah. my, my last memories of that day was was Kevin Muscat kind of flying in from about forty <laughs> yard run yeah. and and doing this kind of like leg breaking ch- challenge, which he was like above your waist, yeah. through, like ten foot before he hit. Good tackle down. for him, wasn't it? But yeah. <laughs> but but timed the tackle perfectly, and I was like, this is a this is a feat of God. Like, how has he managed to run thirty yards and see the whole pitch of the game and won the ball so cleanly? <laughs> and we, yeah. we played actually really well. I, I think we lost. I think we lost one nil. I can't remember the scoreline, but um, yeah, we we we, we Mill held ourselves really well that day. Yeah. Pitch anyway, I, I remember it. Was, it was a good game. It was a fiery game, but yeah, that he was an absolute nutcase. That <laughs> proper nutcase. Did you say you only had um just the year at Brentford? Just just one uh, year. two years, two years. So we two won years, the league, right. and then then um, the second year, I was having a great. I was having a great. Uh, a great season, um, and they they kind of offered me a new deal. They offered a couple of us a new deal, which at the point I was I was I was flying, and, and the new deal wasn't a polite way of putting it. It wasn't uh, very attractive. Uh, it kind of worked out if I was playing to be probably on less money than I was always on, or already on. So I, I ended up uh, turning that down, um, and sadly that was seen as a as a kind of rejection. I was rejecting the club. I would have. The, the, the manager saw it that way which wasn't the case I felt they weren't rewarding me for just winning the league and I was being a standout player I was kind of being put up as vice captain and things like that um, unfortunately the, the chief is that tried to take the mickey and I'm quite, quite, quite a guy who sticks by his principles whether that goes against me or not and um, there was no way I was going to let people take the mickey out of me so unfortunately that's, that's, that's what led to me led to me moving on ultimately um, to, to, the, to the great times at South End, though, so that's 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 obviously a twist of fate that things were meant to be. Yeah, but so at at that time you that you come to South End was was there anything else sort of on the on the table for you? Because we we were an absolute mess at the time. Like we we didn't have didn't have any players. Like Paul Sturrock comes in. Had you sort of heard of him? Worked with him before at all? What what made it, was... it? What made it so sort of? Yes, it wasn't so much known like obviously like South End's a, a huge place um, but it, it wasn't really known in the, in the kind of football world how much it's, it's like nowadays like everyone kind of thinks that the, the kind of non-payment of staff and, and the shenanigans that will only have to happen at South End if you, you kind of think everyone knows about but they don't it's, <laughs> it's like and that's probably why why the club gets well not the club but, but whoever's in charge gets gets away with it so much because <laughs> yeah. because we a lot of the football world didn't really know about the financial struggles and, and and what was going on and 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 a lot of clubs do have struggles don't they so I I wasn't aware of, of what what gone behind the scenes and obviously I, they'd come from a championship club I I just won kind of league two so it was almost like I was seeing yep yeah, they might have got rele- relegated and there might be some problems but that was a challenge to me you know. Um, yeah. And that I was going to help help re- rebuild the club. Um, ultimately, it was it was um, it wasn't Paul Sturrock that actually um, it's, it's, it's Tilson that tried to, that signed me. And then I turned up at the training ground and um, and he was walking out. I kind of knocked on his door wow. to to kind of join, sign sign out right and, and, and join. And um, he'd just been. He said, so, "I'm so sorry. I, I've just been relieving my dues that morning. Literally, I think it was about 15 minutes wow. before I walked in." Never knew that. 
Never wow. knew that. Know. Yeah, so, so, I could, so it was Tilly. Lot. Tilly actually signed you. you, you yeah, there's, the deal there's a lot. Well, he, well, we didn't sign then because there's a lot. I think it's on like Wikipedia and things like that. The, the trial was done. Um, I, I signed on a trial, or I think that was maybe the wording that they put because they couldn't sign anyone um, in the transfer embargo or the way this club was. But yeah, I was actually good. I was actually going to join under uh, Tilston, um, but that happened. And then I kind of walked out <coughs> thinking, well, what's going to happen now? now? <laughs> so, um, so I got a phone call from Paul Sturrock, who um, who phoned me. He was quite honest. He said, "Look, you've got great credentials, uh, senior stats, and things like that. You you've won the league. You've got success." And he kind of I think that was the big thing that Paul looked at. He he wanted people that that um, had tasted success because once you've tasted the success, it's that's all you play for. Really, is that, yeah. is that feeling of, of winning a league or winning a cup or winning games? And you know, you, you know how to win a league. If, if that makes sense, yeah, um, yeah. and so that was that was what he phoned me about. And I said, "Look," he said, "I, I don't know you personally, so and I haven't seen you, so um, I can't just sign you out right. Uh, can you come in and have a look?" And I was, I was like, "No, no chance, love. I'm not coming <laughs> in to, to to do a trial." Uh, I didn't say in a big time. Well, I spoke with man to man with Paul and said, "I'm not willing. Look, I've just come off of winning winning a league. Um, I've only left the club because I turned down a contract. It's not like I've been released." Um, mm. And and um, so so that 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 was the situation. And um, I went to a couple of other, I went went to sign at Wickham. Didn't have the right feel of it there at all. Um, just didn't have that. Just didn't have the feel as a player. You know, go to a club and you you just have that feel whether it's the right place for you. What the lads are like. It's not so much what the lads are like because all the players are, are normally good guys. It's more the way the structure, the training. Um, there's loads, loads of things that go into it. Um, I just didn't feel right. Was, the journey was a bit of a nightmare, and I was thinking, can I be doing this every day because this is going to really drain my energy, and I really want to be up for having a successful year. Um, and so I, I gave, gave Paul a call back, and I said, look, because we had, because we had uh, pied on kind of good terms in terms of the way we talked to each other on the phone, um, and he, he respected my opinion, um, and, and then the way I put across to him, I, I think I gave him a call and said, look. Um, like, could we do something? And um, he said, look, can't come in and do a, like a training session kind of thing with me. Um, and then and then kind of I'll see what you I came in and did this this training session. It was kind of like an in-house training game, if, if you like. Um, and within 20 minutes, he pulled me off and, and signed me. Um, so, and that, that, that was how I signed. Wow. That's mad. I, I, I never that. knew that about, about the, the thing with Tilly. Never knew that. Yeah, how's that yeah. never come out before? This, uh, but yeah, but um, yeah, no, on, my agent on Bobby that Barry first season, was friends with him. That was that, sorry. My, my agent Bobby Barry at the time was good friends with Steve from I think it was from right. their own playing days, so so they had sorted out between them personally. All oh, right, yeah. but um, yeah, it turned out to be a pretty uh, let's say frustrating first season for yourself. Another one you were pretty hampered by injuries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first year was obviously I'm I'm not, I'm chomping a bit. I've kind of already feel, got in the background and feeling like it's a stop start kind of thing. And then I've tasted that success. At, I thought that leaving Millwall, I'd got over them problems. I had a good run at Brentford, real good success and playing well. Uh, so I was almost like like fresh challenge when you go to a new club. Let's let's help this club out. They're struggling. Let's really show what I can do. Um, uh, had a good had a good pre season. Um, Played well in in the games, and then from nowhere, kind of like some kind of groin problems come from nowhere. Was, my groins were tight, and every time I tried to turn and run, I actually played some games. Um, I actually played some games in, in absolute agony. Like when I was turning, I, I remember screaming on the pitch when I was kind of turning, just trying to play through the pain because Ben Clarkson, what a great guy he is, um, had almost exhausted every avenue. Um, it was then there was nothing more. I'd had it's how bad it was. I'd had injections. I'd had two operations. Had uh, Gilmore's groins or sports, sportsman's hernia, I think it was that. Um, didn't cure a thing, um, and there was nothing coming up on scans and stuff like that. So I, uh, luck, luckily, um, Ben reached out to a guy called Ian Cow over in Repton Park and in Chigwell, and um, he he's kind of a consultant for a lot of Premier League clubs, and he went through all these kind of postural corrections for quite a while. It's probably for about seven months, and 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 ultimately, I put that kind of. Um, I felt like a new person. I felt like I never felt before. Like my, I was loose. I, I was I was much more. I was quite a stiff runner as it was. But I think over the years that I'd got stiffer and stiffer and more upright, and and it just kind of 
got my movement pan so much better. And obviously, you, you saw the year that I was just playing on cloud nine. So yeah. I was almost feeling better within myself, but also it was play, catch up time. And I was yeah. going to, I was going to succeed whatever, whatever happened. Cause it was, it was, and it was a great year. Yeah. I think that's always great when a player can do that. Like even for supporters to look at and think like he's had such a, like a horrid time with injuries and he, then he comes in and yeah, you, the, the following season, I think you played virtually every game. I think, what was it? You scored, scored eight or nine goals. Yeah. We, yeah. Like, so yeah. individually we had a great season. And then we, I think any other season, I still think even to this date with league two, I think any other season, our points total that season oh, gets really you ridiculous. automatic promotion. Yeah, I think it was we did 15, 15 years or 20 years, it, it, it was um, an automatic promotion place. But I think as a player, um, it, obviously that was frustrating, but ultimately you look at yourself in the eye and in the mirror and you think, what could you have done? Uh, it may have been a freak year that we didn't get promoted automatically, but there was times I look back and there were some real crucial points which could have been dropped. Because like you said, we were free-flowing. We were we were just tearing teams apart. Like Roots Hall was absolutely on fire. It was a, it was a pleasure to play at. And, and I, used to, I used to love walking out at Roots Hall. And it, we just had that feeling, all of us together, we were kind of like a team of, Paul Sturrock used to call us a team of kind of reprobates. Um, we all had a, <laughs> everyone had a bit of a story. Everyone had a bit, bit of history, but that just added to the character really. And it, it was catch up time for a lot of people at the same time. And, and we really used to come together on the pitch. Some people didn't get on off the pitch. But once we were on the pitch, it was we were unstoppable some days, and we were we were tearing teams apart. But unfortunately, there was there was a few little moments where we. I remember one one um, I can't remember the team, but there was a court. There was, there was I think maybe been been Morecambe at home or something like that, and we we were tearing them apart. It was just any moment we could have scored. I think uh, Liam Dickinson missed an open goal, and then and then um, I think it was Dave Martin the corner come in. He was a near post. He thought someone said mine or something like that, and he ducks and it goes in the goal. It's like, I and, then, that. and that had happened new, now probably about four or five games. So even those fans, you think, oh, we should have got promoted. As a player, and you're, you study things so meticulously and, and the stats. And obviously, you, you might be aware, but players go into a lot more depth than just going out there and kicking a ball around. You know, yeah, there's yeah. a lot more behind the scenes than you study your opponents and things like that. And when I look back here, I, I, I kind of pinpoint about four moments which. Could have could have put it out of even question. We would have been up near the ninety points, you know. Um, yeah. So so that was my frustration. That I was quite I was quite annoyed that, that we'd let ourselves down with them with them childish <coughs> moments. Bearing in mind how how well we played that year. Yeah. Would, would you would you put that down to just like a lack, like just a lack of concentration in the game, or was there certain players that you know not to not not to be disrespectful to them, but were they just sort of not you know were they not up for it or? Um, I think I think there's a difficulty. I think obviously the budgets that clubs have, have got obviously with South at the time, like you said, it was on kind of on the verge of being rebuilt. So still the money wasn't wasn't great what there was around. And um, so I think it's you said struggle with strength and depth. So if you did have injuries and we had a lot of injuries which that year, which players come in and done really well. Um, but we also you have, you haven't got as strong a players coming in. So we did have a good squad, a good set of boys, but there was some times where kind of youth team kids were coming in on the bench and, and players were coming back from loan. Um, and and so I think that counted as well. If you, we, we were a team that played a lot of games, probably if I, I could probably name nine players that played most weeks in, in yeah. the same position. And that probably helped us to our success that we were consistently the same team. And there was times where players had to come in and maybe the lack of games for them, because I don't think uh, Southend really had a proper reserve team uh, functioning. Um, so I think a lack of regular games obviously doesn't help as well for the boys coming in because they're they're themselves like you can they they're, they're keeping themselves as fit as they can, but they haven't got that match fitness and, sh and sharpness, you know, which does does make a difference. So I think there's a lot of elements really that I can't really put my finger on. Yeah, mm. it, it, looking back, it is. It is even now, it's gutting as a fan. So I can only imagine as a player, it's probably even more so. Just you know, yeah, being so, yeah. so, so, so I remember, I remember being at the stadium at the time. I, I remember, yeah, and then ultimately, ultimately, it was a great set of boys. And then you want to keep that core together and be given another chance, you know. Um, and and obviously that, that that led to the kind of the Wembley the Wembley uh, time, but. I just feel the club had come from such bad points, which you guys would know more than me before I come, and such a bad place that any little stepping stones are good stepping stones. It's almost 
I totally get the fans expect the world, but it wasn't almost like the fans were putting pressure on us. It was more so like, like the club. So to go from really struggling, lost all your players, no money, club struggling, and then within the kind of a season and a half, you're looking at promotion yeah. and then the possible Wembley. Who can't see that's amazing steps in kind yeah. of space of like two seasons? So the, my, the key to consistency for me is the small steps and, and to build on it, not to be up and down, up and down. And I think I think that's probably something you see in, with Southend and you guys would know a lot better than me with the history that it's one or the other. Like, <laughs> the, the, like the place they were in like recently to, to be four, like kind of a promotion, it, it seems just so such a roller coaster ride that it needs just some consistency over a longer period of time, you know. And and I, f- I feel ultimately the pool should be being given, given a, a lot a lot more time or a little bit more leeway, even if the results and performance in were coming on the pitch, because he'd already proven he could do it at, at previous clubs. With I think he I think he was one of the managers with the most success um, in terms of promotions in the country, or let alone the world at, at the time. I think he was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Three or, three or four, I think it was at the time. So, mm. yeah, um, he's, he's, he's going thinking about it now, but you know, it is what it is. It's yeah. really, like you say, though, wasn't uh, yeah, in two years from you know, we thought at one point we, we could be going bust before, before like this, this um, big influx arrived when Paul Starrett came in. We thought like that was it, we were going to have the plug pulled, and then yeah, yeah nearly, nearly two years, not, not even two years later, we're we're sitting there gutted because we've not made a Wembley playoff final. It's like, yeah, but just you think back to where we were. But yeah, yeah. you are right. Even as fans, we've sat there at the end of seasons so many times and just gone like, do you think we'll ever have a mid-table season? <laughs> we're, either go- we're either going for promotion or fighting relegation. There never, ever seems to be an in-between. It's madness, isn't it? Even, 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 with the, uh, even with the playoff semi-final with a, a crew, um, Crew were a good team. They were a good team. At yeah. that point. They, they played some really good football. And they're probably the team that, say that, I think we'd done the du- double over them in, in, yeah. in, the, in the league. Yeah, actually. Did. They were. Yeah, we did, yeah. that, at the time in the league, that we they were still a good team. They were known um, as, the, as the best football team in the lower leagues. And I think it was a Dario Grady that kind of brings them up from yeah. the youth and so hand selected the players. So we always knew they were going to be tough. But the kind of game plan is away from home, get something, get something, come away and. And and with them big games, it was almost like we 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 didn't we didn't play to the stre- our strengths, and sometimes emotions can come into play, and emotions always kind of affect the way the way players play. So you can't you have to be kind of like very consistent in your, in your thinking and be like a seven eight out of ten each week. Um, and I think emotions and the, and the opportunity got to quite a few players that day because we didn't really show off. We were known for, for our flair down the wings, switching play like just. Kind of attack going forward, and we were quite we were quite solid at the back. Uh, I don't want to big up myself too much, but um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, on that day it just felt for me at the back, I just felt something things weren't quite right. That we weren't firing all cylinders, and when you kind of recognise that in a game, you feel it's almost like we need to get through this with a draw. We need to keep ourselves in the game, take them back to Roots Hall, and and, and go from there and do the do the job there because they won't want to come to Roots Hall. We we we'll make it really difficult for them, and we we we'll nick it. Um, but unfortunately, I remember I was right ushering the ball out to the ball through ball come. I'm facing my own goal, running back, and the the guy, I think it was um, what was his name? He went to Manchester United, didn't he? In the end, Nick Powell was it? Oh yeah, Powell. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He he he, he cheeky cheeky so and so, purposely clipped my because he wasn't getting no joy out of me. Purposely clipped my heels as I've run away from him, and obviously as I've gone down because I didn't because I've run at quite some speed, I've gone shoulder first into the floor. Um, Something you you just think the players falling down or something like that. But the angle that I landed, I knew something wasn't right straight away. Ben tried to patch up with all kind of tape. I was saying, Ben, this feels like this feels like my shoulder's going to fall off. This is not good. So I had to come off. I think it was I think it was maybe five minutes before the end, something like that. So it was right to the death. And obviously, Paul Stark was desperate for me to get fit. Thought, thought, rest me up. Worst case scenario, like inject me. I'll get through the game. Um, had scans, everything like that in in in, uh, in Leon C. Scans showed nothing, and I'm saying Ben, something's not right here. I, I can get through pain. I played, I played through like um, I played through all sorts of. We'll probably touch on it obviously, but to get us to the LD uh, side of Johnson's pain final. But I've, I've yeah. played, I had appendix burst on the pitch at Millwall one time because <laughs> I then had to get rushed to hospital afterwards because I didn't want to lose my place in the team. I played with a double 
metatarsal break for about two months at Braintree. Like I just do, I, just, I can get through a bit of pain as long as it's not, well, most people class that as too much pain, but <laughs> I'm a little <laughs> bit different now because my whole career has been catch up. So I try to get through whatever I can get through. Um, but we, were, we were up on that day of the, re, the rematch on the second leg, I think it was a Tuesday night. Uh, I was up, t- ben, me, me and Ben went up town, went and saw this kind of shoulder specialist. He said, he said to me, something's not quite right. And we, so we, can I get my man to do a scan? Because I, I know how to read these scans, blah, blah, blah. And um, he, he, he was aging. Paul starts on the phone to Ben going, is he coming back? Because we had to get a train back to LC for the game that night. And it, it was getting quite tight. Um, and the, the guy comes in and goes, like, right at death, he said, like, you've, you've broken your scapula. You've got, like, a massive break in it. And he said, if you play on this, your whole scapula, which the, the huge bone here, um, could come apart and, and obviously you're, you're in real problem for life then. So the decision was taken out of my hands for the for the le- second leg. So that was even more frustrating, frustrating having to be in that situation where I'd got us to help to get us to that point, already yeah. feeling aggrieved that we we're in the playoffs and now I can't help the boys get it over the line, you know. And then I had to yeah. sit there and watch watch that painful night where we didn't we didn't make it from from the, obviously the bench with an arm and a sling. Yeah, that another gutting night. That one, another yeah. one. It's, yeah. You just, just think back to it now, and you, like you say, there's always one team that pushes through playoffs, like late on, late surge, and that yeah. was crew that year, wouldn't it? They just seem to keep yeah. winning, winning, snuck in last day, and then all of a sudden they they go on and get promoted themselves. It's madness when you think oh, about no, it. But they were a good team. It's a real blow. It was a real blow because I was desperate to get out of there. All, almost feel like we, we all felt it was an injustice even being in the playoffs, you know. So it wasn't like we were we were on a down. And like you said, some teams got that momentum and they come up through. It wasn't so much that feeling that we let ourselves down thinking we should have we should have got automatic promotion. It wasn't that we were fully focused on a job in hand. And if we weren't going promotion, we were going to do it through the playoffs. Um so for me personally not to be out there with the boys and at the time I was quite an me me myself, Barks, Coco um, I, was, I was quite an important character in the change room and, and someone that, 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 that could lead the youngsters. And I was kind of on both fences where I was with the senior pros who were quite sensible and professional the way they do it, but could also get on with the, the kind of younger kids who, who didn't quite go play by the rules kind of thing. So I, I was quite an important part of, of, of keeping everyone together, you know? So it was, it, was a, it was a real blow not to be on the pitch. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, you touched on it very briefly there, the, the following season when... Um, we're on the the run to to get to Wembley for the uh, Johnson's Paint final. Yep. Area final against Leighton Orient. Sec- second leg. You were in all sorts of bother, weren't you? What what did you put yourself through that night just to get get on the pitch? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the first leg, I was I don't know. I can't even remember what happened. I don't even. I literally don't even remember what happened. But as I'm walking off, you know the adrenaline stops and things like that. Um, I get. I, I can't. I can't even walk. I'm walking to the change room. I can't. I can barely walk. I said, Ben, you're gonna have to carry me to the change room. Me. <laughs> I kind of like put put my arm arm around him, and um, I take off my boot, and my my foot just goes mass. Like just swells out, and it goes. Oh, this doesn't look good. And you can see my toe was a black and blue, um, and so it turns out I, I've broken my toe, uh, which which was very very painful. And the problem was he. We'd rest it, ice it, thing like this. It's, it's, it's basically a matter of time. You need to just let rest it and let it let it heal. That's all you can do. There's nothing really much you could speed up. We were doing kind of oxygen masks and all sorts of things. I was banging. Don't know how many calcium and vitamin D pills. Like it's like they were like they were smarties, kind of trying to <laughs> add to some kind of obviously, obviously that that second leg was was imperative that that we kind of got through because everyone wants to play at Wembley, don't they? So it's like a like life, lifelong dream for everyone. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I kind of, uh, the only option was to inject me. So I'd, oh, I don't know how many inject, injections I had, but I couldn't even get my boot on. Like even the morning of the game, tried to get my boot on, tried to go for a run, just nothing was happening. Couldn't, couldn't even get, a, like even a comfortable shoe on. You're like a trainer or something like that, let alone a tight football boot. I was trying other people's boots on and I was just not happening. So I said, I don't know how many injections I've had to, um, to, to play in the game, couldn't even feel my foot. But yeah, I um, obviously wasn't going to miss the game for, for anything um, and, and, and helped us through to the, the Wembley final and, and, and played pretty well without 
without being able to feel, feel my feel my foot. And um, <laughs> ultimately, now my toes just direct now because obviously I played through a, all the tendons as direct. It doesn't even bend. It doesn't do a thing anymore. It's just, it's just, <laughs> it's just got a mind of its own. So obviously, I put myself through a lot of a lot of pain that night. Um, which Paul Stoke obviously was very thankful of all the all the boys were very thankful of um and and obviously I was I was assured a place in the in the in the final uh for going through my for my efforts. It was almost a case like look, we know you're gonna it was a decision made with the medical team, with the with the staff. We know you're not gonna be able to play after this for a good period of time because you just put yourself through hell. Um yeah. but get yourself back for that game. Get yourself back for Wembley and lead the boy, lead the boys to victory at Wembley. Um, unfortunately, uh, Phil Brown came in, uh, which was a bit <laughs> premature for, for, from uh, to, to relieve poor of his duties. And the kind of skullduggery started from 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 the start. If I'm being honest, um, yeah. now my playing days are done, and and there was a, there was almost an arrogance of I don't care what he's put himself through. Um, it's irrelevant. Don't care, and I don't. I don't know for whatever reason he had, he adopted that attitude, whether he wanted to come in and put his stamp down or or whatever he wanted to do. But ultimately, the club, the club led the club to success, but made a made a day out of, a massive day out for a, a club like Southend into an absolute shambles and a complete wasted day, anti climax for not only the players and everyone around the club, but probably more so you guys as supporters because. The team was just totally set up wrong, um, and we were never in the game from the first minute to ninetieth. Well, yeah. yeah. could never I kick. Mean, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously touch on that, but just going slightly back, what was it like? Well, obviously, the, the day that Sturrock got relieved of his duties, and then Big Phil Brown just just wanders in, and you know, like it's probably like he owns the place. What, what was going on there? Because um, it seemed odd. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously. We all like Paul, whether whether you liked him or not, you, you respected the guy. And um, obviously, he had, he had his uh, his kind of his individual ways, and his, his kind of Paul is Paul, um, very unique. You won't come across another character like him in football. But <laughs> he he was an honest guy, and he put his, had his heart on his sleeve, you know. And yeah. and you respected that. That he wanted the best for the club. He wanted the best for his team. And and ultimately, he, he would look after you. So. He, he kind of turned a blind eye to a lot of things for a lot of kind of individuals that um, they, they wouldn't get away from other clubs. And, and, and that was for ultimately for the best for the team and the club, um, which worked well. So I, I thought it was premature, but un, unfortunately these decisions aren't, aren't for me to, or, or players to make. So the decision was made. made. So it was almost like adopted that. Oh, it's, it's, it's not ideal, but you, you just think about the job in hand, really. And, you look at Phil Brown. He's got he's got a reputation. He's got a name to him. So he's got Premier League experience. So you so you really hope that he can take us on to the next level and turn things around and 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 and, and achieve success. And looking forward to working under him. Really, I think that's uh, the, the attitude that most players will, will adopt. Yeah. So uh, so obviously, like he 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 then came in. Um, when you get, I think he had two games and then Wembley. If I'm right, I think is it two games and then then the Wembley game. So oh, I'm not too sure. I think it was a little bit more than that. I think yeah, I think it was a little bit more. I think there was because I remember missing quite a few. I think I missed probably about at least four games. So I remember having to. I remember knowing the situation, thinking this guy is just not. He's not going to kind of like. Did you know then? Like even before it got to the yeah, day of the yeah. final, I, I, did you I, know I, he's I not going to play? I knew just the way he was. It's quite. It's quite nasty for some. Nowadays, thankfully, that the law managers changed uh, that that they know how to get the best out of their whole plat team. Um, but then it was very apparent certain people were getting well done, kind of every time they touched a ball in training. You know that like the old old yeah. school stuff when you're a kid, it was really embarrassing stuff. Yeah. Um, so you know, you know, you, you you could do something amazing and you don't get sunk, said said anything to. Someone does a, a five foot square pass. What's a pass? What's a pass? <laughs> it's it's um, it was made pl- pretty apparent who his favourites were. Um, which I don't think is a very good trait in a, no. in a in a in a in a in a kind of a, a member of staff. Bearing in mind it's a squad game, and you will need your whole squad at various times of the season. So I, I knew, I knew, so I knew I was struggling, and that's why ultimately I rushed myself back. Obviously, I had to put myself through agony again just to kind of chase that 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 place to to, to kind of show him what. I, and and, and at the time, this is all hindsight. I'm talking now. At the time, I'd, I'd adopt. I've had many adversities I've had to come over, so I'd always adopt a positive attitude because 
if you kind of think of anything negative or you get moany or you get down, you're never going to achieve anything. You're, you're always going to hinder yourself. So at no point did I kind of have these thoughts that, and, and, and words that I had now. It was almost like, oh, here's a great challenge. I'm going to prove you wrong, which I've done in my whole career, which is a really powerful fuel for really young players to, to have to, to succeed, really. Um, so it was fuel for me. Um, Rush myself back. Obviously, my foot wasn't right. Uh, it wasn't right at all. So I was I was playing through the pain, but hoping that there was a glimmer of hope that that because I was playing that that something would happen. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, yeah. Um, when he when he sat down and and, and, and um, it's, it's, it'd be disrespectful to start naming players when he kind of the way he was bigging up certain players who play in my position in training, let alone coming in a Monday morning talking about their game like like they were, I don't know, Carlos Puyo or something. Or, <laughs> or, 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 or John Terry. I think, I think actually the name John Terry was actually used on numerous occasions to highlight how good this player was, um, which is never, never a great, never a great uh, thing to hear when you're one, not, not that player. Um, <laughs> but so, so when, yeah, but when, when else he sat us down, I remember, I'll never forget the moment. Um, I'll never forget for the rest of my days. He sat us down on the pitch. The old fate, oh, looking back, the old sat, sat down moment as well. I think <laughs> oh, sat down, wagging that finger. I'm the, I'm the gaffer kind of thing. Yeah, sat us down exactly like that, actually. Now, now I think back. And uh, went through the team he's going to start. Obviously, everyone was in shock. Everyone's in, everyone loves, he, he's, he's, everyone wants to play at Wembley only, so they, all they want to do is hear their name. Uh, but... I was in tears instantly. I was trying to, I was trying to kind of obviously not, not show him that he'd, he'd hurt me, uh, but I was, I was, I was like crying inside. I, I, I was trying to hide out tears going down my face. Uh, I had to look the other way because I didn't want to embarrass myself. Um, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, my whole dream in my life was was taken away by this guy who, who was, who had ultimately picked a team that was completely set up to fail. Um, it's like he hadn't. It's like he didn't even know South End existed before he came to us. He'd done no research. Yeah. He hadn't seen what had worked that season to get us to that point. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, was really, it was really, really painful. It was really painful, not going to lie. Mm. But yeah. believe as well that he'd actually, Paul Sturrock had offered a meeting with him to go through certain things about certain players, about what like sort of styles had been successful, how to line up in the final. And he, and he weren't interested. And again, I, like, I've, I'm led to believe one thing he said was, do not play Belel in centre midfield. Play him anywhere else but centre midfield. And he played him centre midfield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 obviously, yeah. Oh, we get told things, but he, he, yeah, it, does, it, it rings true. It rings true. Obviously, Paul, Paul wanted, didn't want to see his, his kind of hard work um, go yeah. down the pan, really. Um, and I think, I think a, a more wiser person, a more kind of open minded person would. Would, would take any advice, ultimately make their own decision. But you have to listen to a bit other people's advice and what people are saying to form a, form a better opinion yourself, I feel. Um, and, and yeah, that, that all the boys were kind of coming up to me that day saying, like, I can't believe you're not playing, like, so sorry, Mark, kind of things. And, and, and ultimately I was on the bench with a couple of other boys that should have played really as well, you know? So, yeah. so we weren't, mm. I wasn't the only one, but I think it was a little bit more painful for me that I'd, I put my body on the line for my club, yeah. the club that I loved and loved being at, um, to 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 not be res uh, respected or that even come into play really. Yeah, yeah. but you, you still you got the uh, you, you got the big game away at Rochdale on a Wednesday night following it, wasn't it? And that was that must have been nice for you. Yeah, don't don't yeah. play at Wembley, but cheers, Phil. I get I get Rochdale. Yeah, I think <laughs> that was another obviously obviously another another purposeful thing. You know, and just another yeah. thing that that was when they were try, obviously looking back now, trying to drive me out of the club, rather than be rather than be honest and rather than be honest and, and and just have an honest chat, which any kind of man growing up would ever ever not not enjoy hearing it. Like you don't want to hear that you, you you're not wanted or whatever whatever the opinion. I wouldn't even know what 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 their opinion was because it was only it was only really expressed to me in real bullying and abusive abusive terms. Um, I'm not going to say some of the stories he'd he done to me, but I ended up in hospital on one occasion before I got released through for a situation where I was desperately ill, and he, he made me he made me come into the training grounds, drive an hour and a half in the training ground. I was nearly passing out in the way, and the, the 
club doctor sent me straight to hospital and I was on a drip just to just to kind of uh Jesus just to kind of spite me really and 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 I hadn't, I hadn't done anything wrong. I hadn't done anything personal to, to the guy. Um, I don't know who he, who he was being advised by at the time, but it, yeah, the thing, the things that go on the, like, behind closed doors, just that's that. This was beyond it, you know. This was beyond it. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I knew I knew my time was done. But that that wasn't the year that you um you left though, was it? You you did you did sort of have a yeah yeah of, no 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 strange. yeah. No, so, yeah, so so I so obviously I had another year of my contract left. Um, yeah. Again, adopted the Ashley. I come back flying. I thought I'm gonna get come back so fit. I'm gonna. I, I don't care. And um, I, I, I done a off season. I didn't even have a pre like a kind of break. I was just in the gym running, playing football. I did everything. I come back flying. It's kind of one one of the fierce in the squad. I was flying around. I remember even kind of him being shocked. Like he was obviously hoping for me to come back like a pile of crap. Off, off, yeah. off the way I've been treated, and I, I, again I just op- adopted the pro- positive attitude. I'm, I'm going to prove you wrong, and I'm going to get back in that team, whether you like it or not, because um, it was the club I, was, I, I really loved being at. Um, and obviously, yeah, the, the, it, I, was, I had a really good season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I a, that was playing really, really well. Loving, loving it again off the back of me setting myself up for a good start. And um, yeah, I had, a, I had a clause in my contract that I think it was if I played 25 games. Um, I'd get a new contract, and one of them. <laughs> yeah, and then ultimately he then, then, with a game he was he was he was there was a couple of occasions that he was really kind of I don't know if he was getting some of the players on his side his side to kind of like dig me out of the chain room stuff like that, but there was some real nasty stuff going on, uh, including a couple of the players as well. One in one in particular, which which really wasn't like nice because I was quite low I was quite low and struggling mentally myself at the time with. Going in day did day in day out to a, to a place of work which I loved, but I was like I've touched on this was day in day out this kind of stuff. So it wasn't really an enjoyable environment for me at that time. I was just going out and trying my best to to overcome it, you know. But sometimes things do overwhelm you, and um, it, it did become too much for me in, in them later days at Southend, and um, it become really difficult going into going into work, and especially with the manager who's against you. And now he's got a couple of players on his side that. Obviously, you want to keep keep him with with Phil Brown that they now joined the join the fight against you, you know. So it was, yeah. it was now becoming a losing battle, and ultimately I was playing well, and he again opted to pull me in um, rather than just say to me, "Look, you're not going to get enough contract, Mark. Like, go out on loan." On the day of the transfer window closing, he um, or the day before actually, he pulls me and says, "Well, you know that you know that uh, one more game." You've got left before you get a deal. I went, yeah. Um, he, he go, I'm worried if it, if it affects you. If you get a, if you get a new if you new deal now, it might affect your perform performances. Can we just take that? Can we just take that kind of a clause out your contract? And I've kind of sitting there going, is this, this guy for real? Like he goes, yeah. If, if we do it to four games, um, that will mean that you'll play well for another four games. Get us through the season, then I'll give you a new deal. <laughs> like is this guy like is he serious? He is like, such a prick, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, just, just he genuinely is something else, isn't he? This, be a man. this is incredible. Just be a man and just say to my face, I'll respect your honesty more. Mm. I won't like to hear it, but I'll respect you by saying to my face, yeah. Look, you're not in my plans. At least you know where you stand there. But it's all so much skullduggery around him. The way he had had a personal vendetta against me to try to break me um, personally. Even when I was playing, I was playing the first team. It wasn't like he had reduced me to the reserves or the Utah. Yeah. I was playing the first team when this was going on. Um, and it's only that it's going to affect his job because if I'm having a stinker, which I did at Oxford away, and really that night was really painful. Was he in the change room afterwards for about an hour after the game, he personally ripped me to shreds. And because I was so low and, and another player jumped on it as well, they were just bombarding me for an hour after the game just say like, things like I don't care you want this club to go down you don't care about football it's all the opposite things of actually how I feel and that's why I call it abuse because it, it, it was abuse and and I was so broken you, I'm, I'm quite a, I'm quite a uh, uh, I don't know what's the way I put it I, I'll stick up for myself if, if, if you upset me up you're going to get one of the nose, basically. Then your wall guys came back. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a bit, I've got a little switch in me. Even though I'm not, I wouldn't say a hard man, 
I was broken. I was. Broken. Oh, we've all got a breaking point. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, I was. I was. I was. I was broken. And 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 ultimately, I thought I'm sitting there and I'm raging. I want to. Not. I can't go for Phil Brown because I'm. I'm. I'm gone. But the player, I think <laughs> it's little. Like he's a little weasel, and I'm thinking. <laughs> And I'm, and I'm like, I just want to rip your head off. But if I, they're trying to goad me to then do something to then sack me, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm taking it because I can't do anything. That's now getting me even lower. Um, but only, yeah, come, coming back to it, I, I sent my agent in and said, look, this guy, this guy doesn't talk to me. He, he, he can't say it to my face. Can you go, go and have a chat and see what say what says to my agent? I, I sat in the car at Roots Hall. My agent literally went in for... A minute, my agent goes, well, you don't want my agent goes, you don't want to be a do you? He went, no, walked out, Mark, we're moving. It was literally like that. He could have done that six months. It yeah, so it that's a, yeah. right. It's like oh, he's gone through oh, he's... kind of rubbish just to get to that point. He's an because he couldn't say it to my face. He's, um, he must he, have, he like, he's managed in the Prem. He's managed in the Premier League. Like he must have had to have those conversations with players. He can't treat every player that he wants to get rid of like that surely not surely he's had to release some players like just the way it goes like say so, listen you're not in my plans I thanks i'll see you later like. kind of but, comment. i don't want to give the guy too much airtime to be honest but, <laughs> but but i can only comment on my my situation the way i was treated you know um yeah. and yeah so ultimately off the back of that um i had i had about six hours to find a new club otherwise i wouldn't have played another game that season my two options were Yeovil, who were who were yeah. struggling to find relegation, and obviously and it's it away. Yeovil, <laughs> or it was or, or it was Aldershot who were stru- struggling re- uh, fighting relegation as well. Um, and, but I knew Andy Scott and I knew Terry Bullivan and Chrissy Barker. Obviously, was was there as well, um, and Glenn Morris as well. So all my old my old muckers, you know. Um, yeah. So no it, brainer. It, it was it was great and. Um, it was it was oh, it was it was unbelievable. It kind of it probably and at this at a, you've got to remember this time. Like to me, mental health didn't exist. Mental health was for was for weak people. I was very much a, a, a I'm not an old school kind of guy, but very much I'm everything's positive. You got that doesn't exist. That doesn't doesn't even come into my mind kind of thing. So I didn't really recognise what was going on, you know. Um, but it really lifted me going to all the shot. It was another fresh challenge now. Um, Andy Scott kind of looked after me, and we we had I think I think we had seven games seven games left, and we were we were dead certs like relegation done like it was it, the season was over. But again, it was a bit a bit it was similar to South End, you know that, that kind of feeling I had. It was it, it was a, I don't care I don't care like the club might be struggling whatever's happening I'm gonna I'm gonna help you I'm gonna come in get get everyone around we're gonna do this together you know like every, all men men to the trench kind of thing and um yeah we 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 um we stayed up with a game a game to spare um at our way at Woking who were the local rivals um and I got I think out of I got three three out three out of the I was there three months or it was two and a half or kind of thing but I got player of the month each month and I think I scored about three goals for him which which I was absolutely buzzing over it was a it was a great time to come off the back of um of what had just yeah. gone on at the South yeah. End, you know yeah, no, definitely. Just so refreshing yeah. as well. You're going from a club where you sort of felt like, oh, she wasn't wanted, so going in there, I bet the, I bet the fans were loving it, the players were probably loving it. It's just a complete chop and cheese, I guess, environment. Yeah, it was lovely because, yeah, it was lovely. South End at the time was quite poisonous. And then obviously to get to the point of success that you got with the, the promotion, I think there was a few painful years where I think, I think if you're leading the ship, you've got to be transparent, honest, uh, you've got to show real kind of values that people respect. And I think uh, ultimately when I go into my coaching career, um, these experiences are, are, are what I will form me as a coach. And, and, and uh, you, I know you want to talk about Daddy Cowley, um, but yeah. they're the qualities that you get success. I've, I've been I've been doing some interviews myself with ex-colleagues and, and managers and coaches, and, and it's all the same kind of stuff. You you. Players get into football as a kid because they love it. They find it. They find it fun. You've got to get them. You have to make it fun. You have to kind of be respected. Um, if you've got if, if you've got a manager who's kind of doing skullduggery and things like that, the players are going to do it. Players are very tense. They're very very led astray. But if you've got someone like a Danny Cowley who's who's honest with you, whether he, he he'll tell you and give you the chance to to 
kind of obviously make up or, or, or get yourself into his team. Um, and ultimately, you've got to respect that. You've got a choice. You can do the best you can and he'll give you that chance because he's honest. Or you don't do it and you make your own decision. It's not really him making the decision for you. You just you, you decide your own destiny, you know? And they're, they're, yeah. their colleagues are really respected a, and a coach because a coach and manager should be looked up to and respected. Yeah, yeah. probably no, no surprise then, really, that they're... They're absolutely flying. Just keep going from strength to strength. Not, not a surprise at all. Another, another great year at Braintree. Lowest, absolute, uh, uh, top, I'm going to be rude, but it's a tiny, tiny club. Um, no budget whatsoever. Um, and when, when they, they formed something really special at that club uh, with, with, with all us players there. And um, yeah, another, we should have got promoted. Should have got promoted mm. to, to Division 2 that year. League 2. Yeah. I remember that because I think there was um, there was a big uh, Fitz Weimark contingent sort of that like followed. So I think like I know it, it was the same. He was Eid's PE teacher, so I think it it almost become a lot of South End fans second team. And I can remember even watching it, and you you almost felt a little bit gutted yourself that you that you um you missed that on promotion. But yeah, yeah. Was, was it? I take it it was quite obvious even then that. Uh, He'd be moving on. He'd get snapped up by a, um, by a higher level. It wasn't really like it was. It was kind of like laughing and joking, like who's on the phone this week, Dan, kind of thing. And <laughs> and me being the kind of a lot of the guys. Yeah, I, I think I was probably me and maybe one other. There's only a guys with league experiences. Obviously, it's in the national league, so it's 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 not um it's not far at all off off of full time professionals. Um, mm-hmm. but there wasn't that many guys we've actually we played in the league. So. It, it, I could get away with certain certain banner that the, the, the other guys maybe maybe couldn't have, but it, and it was, and Alex Woodyard, obviously an ex South End player, would very very lively guy. He he would he would kind of like because he'd been with them from Concord, so he had that kind of person. He was almost like the son yeah. of, and and so he could he could like he could take the Mickey a bit. And it was it was each Thursday like oh, what club are you going to do this week, mate? Or like kind of thing, but but it wasn't it wasn't over the top because. Ultimately, Danny and Mickey are very, very clever guys, and and they, it's almost like they 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 would map things out themselves. They got they got very unique style um, of of galvanising people together. So you kind of think like you don't you don't you don't want them to jump too too far ahead. It's say like a, a lower league Premiership club club or something like that. You don't want them to jump too far ahead because they're very sensible and they want to work themselves up the kind of ladder, you know, and 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 set challenges that they feel they can do something and the club's right for them and they're right for the club um but yeah i'm, I'm sure you i'm sure i don't, I don't know what they're like as school teachers and i, I want to get him on my my in, in, interviews actually i had a brief chat with dan the other week that we're going to get him on um but that was one of my questions what were they like as as kind of in the school were they were they kind of results driven like come on you must run kind of thing or, or were they like they were with us where it was it was really great man management um, I was I was training for hours, one hour only. Hated it because I wanted to just carry on because the standard of training was so good. The players at Braintree were so good, so the the, the standard training you can tell. You, you, I could tell the second half kind of went there that this we were going to do things that year just because what 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 we were doing in training, and um, so yeah, I, I loved it there. Um, but ultimately, yeah, they, they would they would do choose to go on to much bigger things than than Braintree, and obviously that. So with Lincoln and now, now hopefully the, after Corona and COVID, um, great things at Huddersfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think they'll turn it around <clears throat> because you know you look at Alec, they were really struggling before they went in. They've gone there and, and the results have well, they're, not, they're not dramatically changed, but they have picked up and they're, they're well, they, literally, they literally couldn't score a goal. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I, I think under them, I think they'll be absolutely fine. Like I think, you said, I think there's a lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes. What to get them results on the pitch, though? Um, yeah. I think a lot, a lot of kind of people from outside football don't see because, like you said, with with Southend and there's well, Bradford, there's there's numerous clubs that have free fought from from uh, kind of obviously dropping out of the Premier League with the money, the parachute payments, and everything that goes on. You're now competing in a championships for tough league, real tough leagues, Galve, and um, so they, I think, I think. All success is, is is kind of relative, and so for me, they they've already got um, they're kind of on the way to setting the ship, you know. So for me, that's relative success. And we touched on it before that the football kind of goes in cycles, and it's a longer term game. You can't uh, things do not get turned around overnight. You look at Chelsea with Abramovich, like 
they how much how many millions and how many managers and things did they actually rotate and spend and change before they actually got got their first Premier League win. You know, the same with Man City. So then they're they're the clubs with the most money in the world. So what what. No, no one else is anything different. So I think they're doing a great job in, in, in first of all, just stabilising the club. They'll have their, they'll have their short, medium, and long-term goals, um, and I, th- I think, I think they'd be quietly pleased, you know, with the way it's going. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Having, um, having watched a few behind-the-scenes stuff with Huddersfield, and uh, obviously when I was at Lincoln and stuff. Um, I can see that they're quite similar as PE teachers as they are football coaches. So, are they? Are they? Yeah. It was like, like being back at there's certain little crack catchphrases they were saying. It was like being back at school. It was quite weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. They got some memorable catchphrases there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah me, me and Woody would joke around on the way home, like say a few of them catchphrases uh, and <laughs> laugh to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, but I, bet, I bet they're still being used now. Yeah, definitely. But, they, but, but they, they worked with your school. So obviously your school's done some great things on the sporting field through them and I think his, his missus is a teacher as well wasn't she yeah um, yeah she was and, also, of, and also going, going into the going into the semi-professional and then now professional life almost like walking on water aren't they yeah unbelievable really I, I wouldn't mind when I was a kid to obviously have them as my sports teachers because yeah. you'd be set up for, to succeed anyway wouldn't you <laughs> yeah exactly exactly you spoke earlier, you touched on um, mental health and how it sort of, it wasn't perceived to be spoke about, especially by men and then probably even less so by sportsmen. Yeah. Um, then obviously we got the news earlier this year with Chris Barker. Now, as a, we've spoke about this, I'm, I don't really know where you want to go with this because obviously I know it did affect you quite badly so listen what do you want to talk about it or yeah 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 I think I think it's, it's only right to talk about it in, in, in Chris's memory and and obviously to to make some some kind of good and, and, and help anyone out there that that might be in Chris's shoes or, or similar shoes you know because it's obviously Chris, well, what happened with Chris is quite extreme but there's there's people struggling in all different kind of situations and degrees you know yeah. I think if we could yeah. talk about Chris for a bit respectfully, um, it might help. Even if it helps one person listen to this, you know, it's, it's one person that helps. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, if we think, if we just sort of try and remember him as as you knew him, rather than obviously talk about the tragedy that that we all know that has now happened. You know, what what was he like as a teammate? What or what maybe what a lot of people wouldn't know like what was he like as a as a bloke because like you could see him on the field he was this sort of you know, he looked like a real leader a warrior like heart on your sleeve kind of guy but yeah what what was he like as just the just the guy in the in the training ground every day well we'd we'd, we'd call him grumpy granddad like grumpy box <laughs> um, which which is, is is not true at all it's, it's that's what the younger reprobates would call him because he <laughs> he, he was so professional he was just so professional in everything he did, um, on and off the pitch. He was just just a legend, you know. Exactly like you said, a leader, a man's man. So that's why the youngsters used to call him Grumpy Barks uh, because they they were always <laughs> doing something they should have done, you know. And and Barks being that kind of leader and that far figure, he wasn't the kind of disciplinarian and and to tell to tell people what to do and stuff. But he would he would he'd be caring and he'd try to help them. He tried to kind of talk, and we some of the stories of like Ryan Hall, uh, Bilal, like oh my life, like and, and Barks would never be there, like kind of he'd be trying to steady his ship, you know. He was our captain. He he would be the go between guy, and he'd done a lot of things that people don't know about that that that, that helped players and only kept them at the club because any other club they they'd be gone in a second. Some of the things that were going on. So he was he was a. He was a real leader. He'd, he'd walk out on the training pitch, whatever, whatever it was, in that, then, then shorts and T-shirt, and you'd just look at him going, mate. Well, you wouldn't look at him. I'd say to him, I'd say, oh, you're nuts. He'd go, oh, shut up, you southern softy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just be looking in snow. It'd be snow, and he'd, be, he'd go, oh, it's a bit chilly today. Like, I'd be like, mate, chilly? It's freaking minus 10. But, but, um, but yeah, he, he was a character. Loved his cup of tea and his bicky. Uh, <laughs> Love the beer and a night out, like like most of us do when when the time was right. But ultimately, on the pitch, he he, he was a leader. He he'd be he'd be a, he'd be like a seven and a half, eight out of ten every week. Um, he'd be some Mister Reliable, and and um, 
when when he didn't uh, he struggled a bit with his calves calf injuries um when he wasn't on the pitch you you missed him you missed him yeah. he was always like kind of going to that physio room going fast when you fit hey when you fit how long are you going to be yeah. <laughs> yeah. one of the ones that you wanted in your team you know alongside you and me i learned off him yeah i learned i learned even though i wasn't I, w- I wasn't kind of a, a youngster, but I was learning off him, playing playing with him as well. The way he'd read the game, um, and you could tell you could tell the guy who was class and, and had played a high high level, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. So he was just a great guy. So, and and there's no there's no kind of surprise that Sturrock got him in. Obviously, Paul Paul knew Paul was very shrewd in in terms of who he gets. He knew Barks was in straight away. You know, it's like this guy turned up. I mean, I didn't know who he was or anything like that. And Box just turned up, signed from nowhere, you know. Yeah. Obviously, Paul knew all about him, worked with him. All the guys knew about him. And he he was he was a great guy. He was a great guy in every way. And obviously, linked up with him at uh, all the shot as well. And we got success there. Um, just, and this is where it's, it's, it's so, you can't get, I think everyone that knows him can't get their heads around it, really, because he was a man's man. He was very old school. Um Again, I don't think he even knew itself, himself that mental health existed, or or that that would be for like them crazy people, you know. And I'm probably speaking a bit out of place saying that, but I just want to kind of accentuate how you wouldn't associate uh, mental health or, or, or what happened with with Barks, you know. Um, it just it and it just shows you how much behind closed doors and that you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on, and and. Not, not not enough people ask. Well, even if you are, someone asks you, well, "How how are you?" Always, I'm always going to say, "Like, yeah, I'm really good. Yeah, I've done this and whatever." You know, I, yeah, I, I yeah. might be struggling. Obviously, Barks was struggling. People were probably asking how he was, but he didn't tell him. You know, he didn't yeah. tell him because before before it was too late. Um, so I think it really highlights it. Any if it can happen to Barks, like anyone can suffer with mental health because the guy had everything going for him. He was loved by all. All, all, all players, all friends. He, he had so many friends from outside of football. He was such a kind of honest guy. Like I remember um, the coach driver calling me up from South End. And he used to go for beers and stuff with the coach driver. So I'd rather <laughs> hang around and with kind of, I don't know what the word, I don't want to say normal people, but kind of like just, just like, yeah. just normal people. I'm a, I cast myself as a normal bloke, you know. He's rather yeah. hang around normal blokes than be out with footballers or, that that kind of easy. that was the opposite of Barks that lifestyle that's kind of portrayed that footballers are into. That's not the reality at all. We're just normal people. No. Barks was almost normal than normal. He'd yeah. be out with the kit men. He'd be out with the fan, like not fans as in pine, but like fans. He got like old lifelong fans and things like that. He'd be making these trips to the hospitals and stuff, doing all these appearances by himself off to his own back. He didn't need to. Just, I just, I'm just kind of showing what what the guy was all about, you know. He's just an amazing, an amazing guy. Um, yeah. yeah. So when when the phone call come, like most, it was just a oh, shock. Like, what are you talking about? Nah. Like, is this is this a sick joke? Like, I actually had to phone someone else and go, like, is this real? Like, and then I'd phone that person and they go, nah, nah, it's, it's got to be wrong. Like, Barks wouldn't do that. Um, so. So yeah, it, 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 was, it was a devastating blow, and obviously you think about think about his family, uh, his young daughter, which I, I know he, he absolutely adored. He sort of never just went on about his young daughter the whole time, whole time at uh, football and stuff. So, so it, it makes me really sad that obviously that's his me. The family's been left behind as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you um, um you've uh, reminded me of a story actually. When uh, do you remember Madrid, the the pre season in Madrid. That's let's 2000, it, let's 2012. Let's talk about Madrid. Let's keep it clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, or is flying around from there. We um, who did we play? We played the because it was the second game. Was it, uh, Rayo Villacano, yeah, yeah, played their C team or something on the artificial pitch. No, it was no, and, it um, was it wasn't. It was it was their proper was team. It? No, it was the was C it, team Real Madrid. Thing? That was their first C. It was C team. That's Real it. Madrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. it was the real team on the, and, the, and yeah. they had that absolutely amazing pitch next door. Oh, the to ultras. Them. No, no, no. You're playing over there because I couldn't play in the game because my knees were wrecked because of my crucius. I couldn't play in the game. Oh, you couldn't play on the free. It was on that horrific. It wasn't even a free. Well, game. Astro, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, no, I can always remember at the end of at the end of that game. Obviously, that was like the end of the trip sort of thing. And yeah, there weren't many South End fans over there. Um, but I can remember, I remember Chris being like, I think, I think a few fans had like little kids have sort of run on to get pictures with him or something, and he did it. 
And then I think he sort of, he looks around and he looks at all the fans. He was like, now come on, like every, everyone come get on the pitch. And we had this massive photo taken with all, all the fans that have gone out. I think a few of their fans even joined in as well. Yeah, like that yeah. little ultras guy they had with his megaphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the, just the top bloke. And that's did, a picture did, that I'll still look back at. Yeah, he did the same um, in Edinburgh. We had our first pre-season. We went to this horrific place in Edinburgh. He did, did, did the same thing. Got got all the fans. That obviously, we appreciate the fans making that journey, like all to other countries and stuff like that. As, like you said, there's not many that make it, but that's an expense that they go through. Um, it's effort, time and effort away from their families that come out. So, so yeah, definitely. Barks were very, as the captain as well, very much for um, for obviously paying, being appreciative of of the effort that the fans make. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, just top top guy. We spoke to um, we spoke to uh, Liam Dickinson and Reese Evans about. Well, we mentioned obviously Barker in parts, and um, Dickinson mentioned he was out at the time. He was like, I was quite a flash little bastard, and he said, I, I said I didn't really get him, and he said about six months in, he said I totally understood what he was about. He was like, I just thought he was nagging me, and I realised he was just a proper leader. He was like, yeah. six months. He said, well, I was just being a proper little bastard, but I finally got my head around him. Yeah, Liam, Liam, yeah, Liam. Liam was one of the ones that, that that would have been causing a few few dramas. But Dicko was Dicko was a great guy himself. You know, that's 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 what's so unique about the squad. There's so many different characters and different ways of doing things and stuff like that. But ultimately, like Liam said, we all found the common ground. And and after a little while, where where he got his head around, he, he saw what a quality guy Barks was. And obviously, Reese was very close, and they they kept in contact even yeah. they holidays weekly. Got it's going out and stuff, you know. So they, that yeah. Reese and Box were very close. Yeah, yeah. When, when we spoke to Reese, that was the thing that surprised me the most was they only met when they came to South End. I, I, I couldn't believe that the way Reese was like very active on on social media with what obviously happened. You know, it, it would come across they they've known each other since they were like literally kids. So to yeah. have built up such a strong strong relationship in you know really a short space of time just sort of shows like. What a, what a top guy he was. Yeah, yeah, top guy. They, yeah, they just they got shoved into a house together um, and then and then become best mates ever since, even when, obviously, Reese moved on. Um, yeah, they'd be, have their yearly trip to Benidorm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, which they were famous for, um, which Sparks used to always try to get me on, but I was a bit more of a snob. <laughs> I'd, I'd, turn, I'd politely turn the Benidorm trip down. You don't know what you're missing. Why are you going, why are you going to Ibiza and spending £10 a beer? You can get 10 for £10 over here. <laughs> but no, yeah, no, he's, he, he, he's, he's a, yeah, a great guy. A big, a big loss to obviously the, the footballing world. And obviously, obviously the world in general. Yeah, yeah, massive loss. So oh, yeah, I, I think I've, I think if we can take any positives out of, out of the story, that um, mental health could be affect everyone at different points in life. So obviously, the, certain things happen that you don't you don't see coming. You get blindsided, and it's it's really important. And we talk about bravery. I've talked about obviously me playing through injuries and stuff like that. We talked about Box being a man's man and somebody you look up to, up to, run through brick walls for you. Um, but actually, obviously, there's another type of bravery which. Which is not the bravery we 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 associate ourselves with, and actually it's, it's speaking out sometimes and recognizing that you do need do need help, and you don't us us men don't really know the answers to some things. So there are people out there, and that's what friends are for, really. If I'm sure, if you were struggling and or, or you were struggling, that you could say something to each other. Normally, you'd you'd cut through all the b b bs and then, and and, yeah. and be there for each other. You know, and want to help you, mate. You know. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think it was it was something you you said earlier as well, where you'd just say, "Oh yeah, I'm fine." Like some, and you may not be, but you don't want to go into it. And um, I think a lot of these charities now they they kind of they almost like they they do their research. They know what a lot of people say, and they now seem to be going with this new tagline. It's like ask twice because if so, like, if someone says they're fine, it's like, like come on, like because fine like fine's not good, is it? You know, yeah. but you're not going. Yeah, I'm great. Like, I'm good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good. Done this today. Done that. But like, fine's pretty like oof, it's quite sort of leveled yeah, I'll out. Get that. I get that. That's so that's, that's, like that's dig, that's dig a bit deeper. Actually. Yeah, because I've, I've I've struggled since my career ended. I've struggled a little bit. Um, a few things happened at once. I lost my dad, and so if someone would ask me, I could actually relate with that because I'd be like, fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. But if they then ask me again, I'd probably crumble. You know, like and and yeah. at, at a time and actually like kind of just not know what to say and just the emotion come out, you know, so I, I get why that's, that, that's really important and could work. 
Yeah, I think that's it as well. It's knowing what to say because you may sit there and go, "No, I feel like I feel really, really down today," and like, but you might not know why. There could be no other reason for it. You're just having a proper downer. So mm. you're like, "Yeah, I want to talk about it, but I don't really know how to." So yeah, I gradually, I, I do think it's getting better. There are some great things being done for it now, but um, yeah, I think there is a long way to go. But yeah, hopefully we're we're certainly not going to go backwards with it. Yeah, no, I think I think the game, the game of football is definitely evolving in terms of that because ultimately, managers aren't that kind of uh, preacher now, and obviously not like the dictator. They now they they realise that these players are here for a reason because they're quality players, and actually the psychology is a big part to play in the game. And how do how do I get the best out of each of these individuals? You know, so I think that's really important because it's like, it's like why why in the Premier League you sign a player for ten million. He's not kind of scoring goals. Like, why are you not going to work and try to help him get back to the play that he was maybe six weeks ago? You know, so so the mentality and mindset is such a big thing. So why why don't we look at it in a in a positive way? How it can affect us positive positively, but also the effects it can have us on the negative side. You know, um, I think yeah. the whole picture needs to be. And I actually read a story. Funny enough, we were on today about this um, because I've, I've read a little clip about uh, Tony Adams. Uh, today he was talking about Wenger when he first come in that that he used to avoid confrontations at all time and then and that he would always ask how people were and and he'd say like oh you look a bit tired have the day off you know which is which is unheard of you know yeah. The, the, you, yeah. You, the football mentality that I, I was used to it would be you go in if you're not okay then it's going to be against you almost like you're not going to be picked in that team anymore, which is it's still around. I understand why it's around, but I also think that the, the, the younger generation of managers coming through look at the whole picture. They look at all the, all, all the different pieces of the part puzzle to, to kind of get the best, get the best performance out, out of players on the pitch ultimately. And then I think it was a testament to Barks actually at the funeral with it. He, he was, he was so loved at Forest Green, but and his whole under 18 squad was there. The, the kids were in absolute bits to, Obviously, that they, they looked up to him as well. So I think it, anyone will come across the guy who's just he's just a great guy. So if it could happen to Box, we, it can happen to any of us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, try, trying to link it in there to what you said with um, like young young managers now, like sort of starting their careers. You're you're doing a bit of coaching now. Do you want to tell us about that? Tell us what you're up to now. And do you yeah, sort of yeah. have, yeah, have any aspirations getting in the pro game with it? Um, hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. So, I kind of when I was winding down my kind of well, not winding down, but I was doing a bit of coaching beforehand, and 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 it kind of got it's quite satisfying and rewarding. So I think it was I got a buzz about kind of seeing seeing the kids and seeing seeing well not even kids because I coach all ages, seeing young pros um, doing a little bit extra with the young pros. I think that's probably where it comes from, um, and just passing on some knowledge like. When I was young, I used to get taken outside by the older pros and, and, and they'd do a bit with me. Steve Grip particularly used to kind of take the young pros out and do an extra hour and a half after every day when everyone else had gone home. So I used to try to kind of help young pros and give, give them advice and the youth team as well, boys. So I think it came from there that I used to get a real satisfaction of seeing someone implement something and see them being, being really frustrated with something that they can't do, but helping them and showing them how you can actually overcome uh, challenges. And then obviously that then has, has, has kind of formed into the point where I, I was looking, I'd send my own kids to coaching companies and stuff like that. And I wasn't, I wasn't quite happy with what, what was, what was going on, you know, and, and, and that, I kind of, a moment happened where I thought, well, actually this is no disrespect to the coach or anything, but they haven't got experience of what I can see. Um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to work, work hard enough to, to have a great career. And, and I've seen a lot of kind of, ages throughout the years what success is all about how you get success what skills you need to play in professional the profession the difference between pro amateur all the different kind of elements that, that go to it because i've played for 25 years so so i've suddenly just become really passionate about i can actually do what i'm seeing here a lot better and then and, and, and i can help these connect the next generation and um, to then achieve whatever they want to with my professional mindset so you have to tweak it a little bit because obviously I was quite a results driven person where I'd do anything to achieve. So you have to tweak it to be fun and, and, and then enjoy it. But I just found this passion inside that I didn't quite achieve what I wanted to do because the Premier League for me was, was where I wanted to be. I felt I had the qualities when I broke into the middle first team in the championship that the games were easy. They weren't easy, but they were comfortable for me. I was playing against some big names who 
who I didn't find that hard. And I think I had the frame to, to suit the Premier League rather than a naturally big, huge tower and centre back, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm now passionate about helping the next generation to achieve what they can do through my experience in the professional game and the coaching I've been doing now for the last 10 years, a, a, a kind of a, a grass, a, a bridging the gap between grassroots and professional football, you know? Um, yeah. Not quite, I've got, I've got a kind of problem where I've got kids, so I, I need kind of a, an income for, for uh, to, to step into an academy because the academies aren't, aren't unfortunately that well paid until you get certain roles but I'm really kind of earning my stripes helping as many kids as I can in through my academy in Bromley and Beckenham and fortunately I've, in this lockdown actually I've taken reflection on actually success of where I wanted to be because I always focus about I'm a perfectionist and most most footballers are they want everything to be perfection that, that probably leads to your downfall but in this in this uh, in this in this kind of downtime I've, I've taken the time to reassess where I'm at and it suddenly dawned on me that Mark, you've, you've got like players that played in the England under-16s. You've probably got about 13, 30 odd players that you've got into professional clubs, and forget about that. That's the, obviously the, the 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 kind of unique stuff that where where they're the, the top top end players. But how many kids have you helped just with their confidence, made them going from like an individual to then join their team? And so all the results are measurable, and I just just love what I do at the moment. To be honest, so I'm just loving building my academy, helping as many kids as I can. And then really passing on my knowledge, and and I, and, I, and I don't think there's any age that you can't drip feed that into kids. Even if, like you said, you were fortunate enough to be uh, uh, coached at PE by Danny Cowley. I'm sure he's drip feeding you with stuff that has, has helped you along the years that you wouldn't even even realise. So I'm really I'm really passionate about passing my knowledge on and the knowledge of of all the professionals and unbelievable players I've been surrounded by, including Barks. On, on to the next generation and giving them a head start in, in whatever they want to do in life, you know, because being a professional footballer also transfers into the qualities to succeed in life. It's not just football, it's other sports. I suppose there's loads of different sportsmen at the high, and sportswomen at the highest level. It's all transferable skills. And I'm, I'm really, I was lucky enough to find my passion in life. And I want to help other pe people find their passions. I don't feel people should just do things for the sake of it. I feel fortunate and lucky enough to do what I loved. And um, I want I want to help as many people achieve that as possible. And if that's in football, brilliant. I want to help your mindset as well. If it might be someone else, because you two guys are doing we're doing we're on a Zoom call now. This is football. This yeah. is football. Like you don't have to be an unbelievable footballer just to be involved in football. Football is the beauty of football. It's an amazing game. Everyone loves it. And with my interviews, I'm now getting coaches. You could be a coach. You could be a football manager. You could be a sports writer. You could be, you could be a vlogger. You could loads of things for game, you know. So I just want to really help uh, the kids in, in in as much, many ways as I can before I then then step into the professional games and coach myself. Brilliant. Well, it's, it's really refreshing too, actually, because yeah. sometimes I get that cliche answer of, um, "Well, yeah, you know, I'd like to be a manager, and you know, one day I'd be in the prem." But you sort of seem to focus there on just just making the players better, whether that be as, as footballers or just as people. Yeah, I think, I think that's the underlying factor. You, you get into football because you love the game and you, you play it because you're fun. You choose to play. You're not made to play it. You play it and choose to play it for fun. And it, I, think, I think I'm fortunate enough to now I choose to coach. And it's almost like my kind of, I see it as my therapy. Football, you, any, any, you've got any problems in your life, you go and play football, you forget about it. It's the, it's the same with yeah. coaching. Like, I've, I've missed it so much. And we've just been doing our small group sessions and since the last couple of days ago. And, and even though we're socially distanced and, and we're kind of like, can't tackle and stuff like that. It's, I've, I've been buzzing. I've been buzzing all week, like just to kind of be back out there, you know, and and seeing a look on kids' faces and then seeing seeing them master something. I, I had a little um, they're funny, not relative at all, but I had a little uh, four-year-old. It's unbelievable. Four-year-old uh, wanted a little kind of taste the session uh, a couple of nights ago, and I said, "Oh yeah, it was my, it was, a, it was my friend's uh, nephew," and uh, I said, "Yeah, I'll do a bit." And I got him doing step overs, like the kid's four years old. Like, I got him doing <laughs> step overs, drop the shoulder, take it down the way. And I'm just sitting there and I was beaming, you know. Yeah. I could see his dad looking over. His dad had no clue, like, how difficult <laughs> this was, you know, like for a four year old. I'm sitting there just buzzing, like, you could see the glow from it. So I, I, I just love it, really. And then obviously, I'm fortunate enough to have the professional experience. And, and then I want to tie it all together, then to come back into the, obviously the seriousness and, and the kind of the stats game of, of the professional game where results and obviously helping feed kids through to the first team or the reserves or 23s, whatever that may be, you know? So I've, I've, I really want to learn that knowledge as well. 
but it's, 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 it comes back to if, if I had the money, if I didn't have, the, if I kind of didn't need the money, it's something that you do for free, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's the same thing as a footballer. You look at these footballers in the Premier League who are earning millions, ultimately, at some point, they would have been playing for free. They would have played for free. Obviously, the, yeah. it's now, you can't become fixed on the money. It's, it's, these are byproducts of success. And, and you need to remember that success comes from ultimately loving what you're doing and wanting to be the best and perfecting everything you do to the best of your ability. And have that, have that work ethic and that desire to, to achieve, really. Um, so more than all the skills and all the tactics and the, and the body positions that I coach, I love to throw, I would love to throw psychology into it as well and, and trying to drip feed that success because, and, and it's really interesting to talk to Andy Marshall actually today because he obviously had 20 years um, as a player. He's now into, his, I think, his seventh year as a, as a professional coach at Aston Villa and, and Charlton. And he said, which which is a great bit of information for you guys. People say that, um, you know, the talent is God given, you know, you know, it's, 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 I don't believe, from where I've been in my career, most coaches and, and grassroots coaches will say, oh, he was just a one-off, you know, it was a one-off, like, it's not that at all. Everything he's coached or everything he's learned probably is the best way of saying it. You just need to feed these things into people and believe, make them believe for as early as possible they can achieve anything they want. Because it's almost like you, you grow up having them dreams of, of lifting the World Cup in, you know? You know when you're kids, you have to lift the, the FA Cup final. I used to dream of the World Cup for England. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and real life kicks in and you forget about the dreams because you'd, you'd be called crazy, wouldn't you? Yeah. But ultimately, you've got to believe in them dreams and believe them them and things you want to achieve and hold on to them and don't let anyone take them away from you because that will drive you to such ruthless success you won't believe. You've got to encourage risk taking because if you don't take risks, things yeah. won't happen. And it's just about being the team being kind of set up to allow some individuals to take risks. So you, I used to take risks on my, on my six yard box doing Cruyff turns. Like <laughs> look over as I come out, I'd look over and see see like the manager like about to pull his arrow, you know, and I, I just, I just chuckled to myself, going, "Why are you stressing? Like, I knew what I'm doing, but I've never been caught once with this yet. So it's, 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 it's tricked many a player. But I think, I think it's you, to to have success, you've got to create an environment for for people to be comfortable and express themselves, um, and then explain in the right way. If, if like you said, if, if things aren't quite going well for them, you got, you got to show them, show them how it's going to go well and keep on going. Okay, as long as you're telling them the right things and, and, and breeding the right ethos, you will get success. It's not like, oh, I tried I try to turn, it didn't work. I could have scored, but I missed. I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. Do it again. Do it again. You've got to be that person who encourages them. Do it again. Don't care how many times you miss them. Failure yeah. fail is a chance to learn. You learn more from a losing a game at football than you do, than you do when you're winning because everyone thinks you, you're doing everything right. And then suddenly you get that reality check and, you, and it's like, oh, what happened there? And you learn more from it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, yeah, just just a couple of things before we before we finish up, and again, this is something that I've been reminded of just just hearing you speak. Did you ever have a specific game plan when you specifically played against Akin Fenwa? Because there's a reason I asked that question for for as long as I've watched South End, he has been like a constant thorn in our side. He seems to always score against us. He uses his body like we all, we all know what what he does. He's he's fantastic at what he does, yeah. but not to blow smoke up your ass, genuinely, you're the only defender I've ever seen sort of cope with him or play well against him. Did you sort of really try and get into his head at all? Um, well, no. Um, so, yeah, I was quite, as you know, I'm not a stereotypical centre-back. So thinking and, and, and kind of like big, like chess or drafts was, was, was a part of my, my style of play. I'd always be kind of touching you, like making you think where I am because only they're going to be looking over their shoulder. If they can feel you, like Bayo, he's brilliant and like, he, he'd strength yeah. five of me. Um, so <laughs> I can't get, you can't get too tight. Always shoulder put. So as the ball's come to him, if he can't feel me, he doesn't know where I am. So I'd always be on the blind side of him. So everyone says Mark Gold side on the, on the right or the left side, but I'd always mix up where I was going. So he's constantly looking for me. So then when he's that split second, and because I was quite sharp and I'd always in training work on five yard movements. So because I was sharp, I'd, I'd be watching the ball, watching him. Second he looked for me, I'd be rounding, kind of taking that ball at his feet. Or it'd be, if I knew I couldn't win it, be touch off, touch off, but niggling his feet, niggling at the ball, trying to nip it so he can't turn. Um, yeah. 
Um, me and me and Bad, funny enough, actually, that me and Bad had a lot of conversations about this. They he used to say to me, I used to not hate playing against you because the guy's obviously not he's, he doesn't fear anyone. But he used to say that he, I was one of the the niggly players that used to get into him and I was wiry and stuff like that. I was awkward. I think that was the word that he, he used. I was really awkward to play against. Um, we actually played against each other um, at Swansea when I was at Millwood. He was a real youngster. And um, we, uh, we we didn't go on too well at the start, actually. And, and, and I, I kind of had a real kind of good game to come as a young sub. He was, he was ripping up the game at that time. And I kind of like marked him out of the game. Uh, and... And we, he offered me out and sh- <laughs> off, off the pitch afterwards. So we kind of walked side by side all the way to the change rooms to kind of have this fisty cups. And it never happened. And next time I saw him, he was in the, he was in the, I was just coming back from my cruise at Millwall and he was just coming back from his broken leg. So he'd come on to do a trace to train at, uh, at Millwall. The few of the boys were going, what are you going to say to him now, Mark? He said, it's like, I don't want now. I was like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but I didn't say anything in the first place. That was the thing. I'd never get involved. I'd never get involved. i never any verbals. You can talk to me all you want. I'd just let the football do the talking. And, and I, yeah, I had a bit of a horrible streak that when the time come, I'd let you know I was there. <laughs> and I wouldn't have to say anything back. But yeah, Bay- Bayo was... It was just part of game, part of my kind of game plan, really, that I play every individual differently, and Bayo's as strong as an ox, and never get tight to him. If you've kind of forced him back, or if you can nick it, get he, he was, he's, Bayo's very sharp and very fast over kind of 10, 15 yards. He's surprising, mm-hmm. and his technique is frightening for 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 kind of guy guy of his stature. He's a really really good footballer. Um, you saw, you've seen some of his one one the goals. You know, it's just not the strength. Oh, yeah. He's, he's the only he's the only part of his game. So I knew I always knew it was going to be a tough game, but that would all make me raise my game as well. So yeah. I'd have to kind of get tight, try to nick around the side of can, almost set almost set it up in advance as well. So I'd always be communicating to my midfielders, my strikers, showing right, showing left. So I'm always edging, always trying to nick yards to then. Turn the turn the scales in my favour because if I then get too tight, I know the battle's I'm done. So it, it, I'd then have to kind of like almost like plan C when I initially you got to get yourself out of his grips and get yourself back into a position you can be effective. So I'd always do a lot more than just me marking him, you know. And fortunately enough, like you said, I've done I've done okay against him, and he'd go over to my my defensive partner and unfortunately give them a tough time <laughs> and I couldn't do yeah. I couldn't do much about him then because he'd, 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 have, he'd have his kind of wicked way on him and, and yeah. I remember him scoring an unbelievable goal didn't he at, at a roots hall when he brought it down his chest and yeah, uh, bodied it in didn't he, he yeah he, he, like, oh, he scored so many against him all, that, all day and he, he's kind of done that <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you, yeah. Know, you, you hit now there did like you say don't get don't get too tight to him because um when we played against Wimbledon, I, I think you, you either played or you might have been on the bench for Wimbledon at the time. And um, the, the fellow we signed, I guess, who... Yeah, actually, played, no, I played in that game. Yeah, I played in that game, yeah. I, I, think, I mean, I, it might be that the, the, the person's out in sign, I think, to, re, to replace you at the time. <clears throat> he had a real habit of um, diving in for everything or getting too tight. And I think he got sent off on his like, second game by, by getting too tight. And that game, back in Fairmore, he just kept trying to beat him. And even from the sidelines, I mean, even like everyday sort of fans are getting to the stage where like, come on, like you're not beating him, just let him have it, get off him, and, and he and he won't have it. Ultimately, he gave away the free kick and they scored from it. So, yeah, um, yeah I, think, I think that was part of the parcel why why I kind of probably why part of why I, thought I should have played higher in the Premier League without the injuries because I was such a, a, a thinker. I I could I, I I wanted I was a footballer. Ultimately, I was a footballer. I wasn't just a kind of headache kick it defender. I wanted to be a footballer. I wanted to perfect my passing. And, and I used to take every individual as, as they can. And I think you have to as a player anyway, to a certain degree. But me more so because I didn't have the physical stature. Even though I was quite strong, I'm quite a wiry body, but I was quite strong in the, in the gym as well. But I wasn't a Chris Barker, who's like just, yeah. like, you know you're not moving him, you know? If I put myself in a... Even though I never get got weight, it wasn't because... I was stronger than them. It was because I'd always make sure I used my body well and put myself in a correct position to not be less vulnerable. Um, yeah. And I'd, I'd put myself in a position to make them off balance. So yeah, it sounded like I'm recreating the will, but yeah, there was, there was, there was, there was a lot more. In, I'd think about things a lot more than than, than, than usual because yeah. of the individual that I was coming up against, really. Yeah, no, I might, I might you right, and I, I think the best compliment I can almost give you is that. Probably, if you didn't have the injuries you had, you you probably wouldn't have ever played for Southend. To be honest with you, 
Yeah, I think definitely you know, not. <laughs> you know, playing the championship, if not higher. Like we, I remember at the time when that when you came back fit, everyone was like, "I can't believe this player's playing in League Two. You know, he's, he's defending. We're not conceding. He's getting a goal every game, sort of thing." And it's like this yeah. is unbelievable. Yeah, so, no, no, it was, it was it was good. Yeah, I, I love the Shrimpers. Yeah. Mark, thank you very much for taking your time out to speak to us. Been, to be honest, very open, very honest, very eye-opening chat with you. Um, wish you nothing but success with with what you're doing next. Yeah, cheers, yeah, yeah. Cheers, mate. Cheers, 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 cheers. Cheers. <coughs> oh, sorry. Ten years, probably one of my, my favourite South End players in the last ten years. So I really appreciate it, mate. Oh, brilliant. Much, yeah, much appreciated for the kind words. No worries, mate. I hope, yeah. I hope your recovery goes well. Anyway. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah, right. get well, get well soon, mate. I hope you're on the right track. Perfect. See you later. Good night, mate. See you, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye.